Thanks for listening to the Kojima Frequency. If you're enjoying the show and want to help support it, make sure to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Kojima Freak. You know, you guys are probably going to grill me on my... Uh my metal gear memories uh, like <laughs> like the knowledge i have of the lore but it, it's you guys know it's so freaking convoluted yeah so name six members of the patriots right now no we're not yeah, we're not yeah that no team. i cannot <laughs> please don't do that <laughs> i did the oh, you're um, a fan huh? name every type of gear yeah yeah, yeah. No, no, we're I, not doing I mean that, I, no. I just i can't i can't i like i i did the um the you know we did the making of metal gear 4 mm -hmm. and i i wrote that <laughs> script for the 20 year history and i did all the stuff on uh you know where everything was um how it all connected from the nes games to the playstation games and I, it was a lot of work trying to decipher all of it. It's a huge, just big mystery pool, all of that stuff. So yeah. it's wonderful, but I, I can't remember it all. <laughs> yeah, I actually went back and rewatched it, and I was uh, recently, and I was sitting there going like, man, this is, this is a great like primer for someone that doesn't know anything about this series at all. Like you did cover it really yeah. well, you know, like just from oh, thank all you. Of those points, you know, it, was, it made it really digestible. As, as big as, you know, and as many as the plot points are, uh, and as ridiculous as it gets. It was such an incredible project, but, you know, you guys can feel free to ask me about that or anything. Yeah, cool. Hey, I'm Fingers. Yo, it's Apache Smash. Hey, everyone. This is Days Ahead. And I'm Nitroid. You're listening to the Kojima Frequency. All right, well, yeah, we got Victor Lucas on the show. This is pretty cool. I definitely remember back in the day just listening to you all the time on on G4 and on Electric Playground and, uh, you know, seeing you on the on the Metal Gear Solid 4, you know, the making of. That, that was a huge thing. But, yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, this is great, you guys. Thanks for having me. I, I know how important this podcast is to Kojima fans and Metal Gear fans all over the world. I'm a massive Metal Gear fan. And uh, it, when you guys asked me to be on, I was like, oh, my God, yes, I'd love to do this. So thank you. Yeah, we actually met at the uh, Konami press event. Uh, Nitroid and I were out there when we were covering the uh, the Master Collection, and you were out there. And so, yeah, it was really yep. cool meeting you out there. And, yeah, thanks again for coming on the show. You guys were so kind, so nice. <laughs> I, I, love, I love when people are experts like this, you know, in a specific category. And, and there is so much material in Metal Gear to – to dive into it, it's it's a no-brainer oh and all the stuff that kojima does man what a, like <laughs> legit genius you know just yeah. a risky genius kind of human being that really wants to try and i think he knows that he's a bit of a genius too which is fine yeah but he is uh you know like his ideas are are amazing and the team that he collects to put these ideas together. Mm -hmm. Just incredible. That's the biggest part is his team selection is really good. And yeah, de definitely people yep. love uh, saying he's a genius and I, I definitely agree. I think he likes hearing that too. I mean, if you watch that uh, Connecting Worlds thing on Disney, <laughs> yep. we all watched that together. Uh, it, it was it was actually uh, really good though. We, we kind of went into it. Yeah, that was good. What did Shinkawa say? <laughs> like, I don't uh, know if he's a prophet or <laughs> that was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah. There was circle jerking. First of all, hello, Victor. Good evening. I'm very <laughs> sorry. My mic and audacity rebelled against me, um, but everything uh, is okay now. Great. In any case, uh, yeah. So we we had a little powwow um, on last week. Watch Connecting Worlds. I got to spin up my popcorn machine for the first time, so that was exciting. Um, That's cool. And we were really concerned that it was going to be just like a 90 minute circle jerk, but I, I think it was so much more. Um, and the circle jerk did come out with some bangers. I forget the exact quote or if this is the exact quote, but I remember someone talking about, you know, on a world dictated by like the algorithm, someone as yeah. creative as Kojima is the antithesis of the algorithm, which <laughs> yeah. we were in the discord, like banger. Like that was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, en Enemy of the algorithm. Yeah. Enemy of the algorithm. That was it. Right. Yeah. That was, was good. Like, that's an album name right there. He does create that kind of uh, that that cult um, personality, that culture of this this larger than life person in his office as well. You know, having had the opportunity to go to Kojima and work with the team and and interview him, he definitely 
likes his leadership position and he understands the responsibilities there and um he works best in that kind of direction you know he's able to kind of impress upon everyone that he it, he's the leader and he's got some some big ideas and he's he's going to reach with with real ambition now he employs a lot of people to kind of cultivate what those risks are going to be and what that ambition is going to be but he is uh uh yeah he definitely likes the stat the stature and the status and I, I think that there could be a, you know a perceived problem with it but i also think that there is this um level of ego that needs to exist whenever you're taking big swings mm -hmm. you know and yeah. um Usually that gets people to kind of go, okay, well, he's the boss. He's got this figured out. We're going to try this wacky thing. We're going to carry these boxes all across America. Let's go do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. He's got some visions for sure. Yeah. You can't yeah. be strictly artist minded either. So you've, you've got to balance the, the art and the business, which he seems to be really good at. Totally. I mean, it's funny. You, you hear the ideas about back in the day, he like wanted to do the, uh, the blood smell from the disc, you know, I think, what was that on oh, Snatcher? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but nowadays we have the, uh, actual smell machine or w what the hell was that thing called? I, that, that was like a few weeks ago. It seems like now they, when they premiered that you can game and smell at the same time. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like back in the day they were like, ah, oh, no, we can't be doing that. It's crazy. But here we are. Yeah. I know that I smell. I think we covered that in EP back in the day, actually. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the, just the the connecting worlds documentary. Going back to it, I mean, it was it was it was cool to see how hands on he was in pretty much every department, you know, and just having that type of direction with everything. Um, it, it was a cool, uh, cool documentary. The the music in it was oh, amazing. It was some good like Blade Runner vibes throughout. It was just good stuff. There's all there's such a cool aesthetic in Kojima Productions. I haven't been to the new office, but mm. the the one that was headquartered in Konami. It was very different, and and uh, Konami LA, the, the LA office, you mean? No, in or the, or the uh, in, in, in Tokyo, yeah. Um, nice. It, it was it was very cut off because you know we did the whole behind the scenes on Metal Gear Solid Four, and that was the biggest project we did ever as a as a production company for our our making of stuff, and uh, we did a lot of traveling. We um, we did stuff in Los Angeles and in Washington D.C. and stuff, but the um, uh, the Tokyo office, I, I'm sure you guys have all read this, but there was, a, you know, a, a real legitimate um, uh, disconnect between Kojima and Konami. And there was a lot of, like, Kojima was not super into going through Konami. Like, we did our, mm -hmm. our deal to do the work on that project with Kojima Productions, not Konami. And oh, we wow. dealt directly with them. And wow. it was not a... Uh, um, there was a concern about leaks and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they were very security minded and very, both sides were, it wasn't antagonistic. We never, you know, cause we were outsiders. We were from, from Canada, um, our production team. Um, and we would never see that firsthand, but we got a real sense. Like we were just allowed just in the Kojima section of the, the studio. And we got a little bit of the bristle, but that whole Konami headquarters, that whole, I forget the name of the uh, the area now. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous building, gorgeous facility, very cool high tech instruments. I mean, it felt like you were coming into a, a Metal Gear installation <laughs> when yeah. he went into their into their studio space. A and their offices were amazing and such cool people, such super friendly, talented people. We went out for sushi with Kojima and Shinkawa, and um, uh, we shot some of that. But it, you know, it was just. It was a really ridiculously wonderful experience and opportunity. It was so much work, though, guys. It was like 300 <laughs> hours of footage. Wow. It shows. It really shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was It was huge. And I'm sure the production team that worked on this most recent documentary uh, had some of the same things. Because the thing that was a part of the doc that we did, it was on the disc. It went with the game. And it was one of the first... Uh, blu-ray like we designed the whole blu-ray as well that whole chunk of what went with the blu-ray and so oh, we cool. did all of that work and we sent it to sony to press and uh, uh you guys know the game at metal gear 4 you know the opening sequence that was all done at uh what was it called hello is it logan yeah logan was it hello yeah. logan 
I think it was just Logan. Uh, just Logan. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe their website was was Hello Logan. But we went to their studios in Los Angeles, and we w- were there for all of the filming of the opening sequences that David was there for. Uh, I think Julie Newmar. That's where we met Julie Newmar, the uh, old Catwoman off the old Batman TV show. Um, <laughs> oh, that's cool. She she was up on stage and. Uh, uh, and we had this little fake talk show sequence that they put together and there was a fake cooking show thing and it, everything was super high tech. It was so surreal and so ingenious, you know, like just booting up that game. I think people have kind of dismissed the, I think that was an even more inventive game and creative game than five was. I think five was almost a response to the success of all these other cool open world games out there. Yeah. And then they put key for Sutherland in and it was really cool. I liked metal gear solid five, but I think four was such an ambitious project to pull in all of this multimedia in such a, uh, I mean, it was a big leap from the storytelling and the, and the ways that they put this transmedia type of content into three and definitely anything that did from two and one four was a huge leap in production values. And, and there was like a Hollywood thing and they wanted us to interview a, um, um, a a real expert on, on the military. And so we went to Washington DC and, uh, man, I should have got all these names in front of me, but we went to Washington (laughs) DC <laughs> and, and we interviewed a uh, um, a gentleman from the Brookings Institute. Peter is his first name, but he is an author now. And we put him into the documentary, um, talking about child soldiers and the inevitability of uh, robotic warfare, and and you know how there was always a prescience with the themes and the ideas that Kojima was putting together in his games. And he could reconcile that with what was actually happening in, in the real world military. And he was perfect. And he, he was just a guy that I found on the internet. You know, he was, <laughs> uh, he was, he just looked like a good looking guy that really knew his stuff. He was on the, the, the like political news sort of escape out there, you know, he'd pop up on MSNBC or whatever, but I thought, okay, well, this guy can probably speak to that. So I reached out to him, cold reached out to him and we, we traveled to Washington DC. And then we went to, to Dallas from there. And I don't remember if that was for electric playground or for, for this documentary, but he was terrific. And then he ended up contributing to the call of duty franchise. Cause now he had this new thing on his resume that he was a, <laughs> an expert on military, you know, communications around video games. And so the call of duty team, uh, picked him up and he's an author and, and he's, he's quite successful and has done lots of cool things as well. But the other, the interesting thing that we did, and, and this whole project came together because of a friendship that I struck up with Ryan Payton, who is uh, a, an American and he's an ex journalist. Um, and now he runs, um, uh, the, the, uh, camouflage team working on VR experiences. They, they made the Iron Man VR game for Oculus. We actually have had him on the show. Yeah. We love Ryan. Yeah. Oh, yeah I love he's Ryan. The best. Yeah. He's an incredible guy. He's a guy that won't remember that won't forget any of these names. That's for sure. <laughs> but he, he was, uh, he was just an amazing person to work with. And, and he saw that, you know, our passion was really to show the authentic behind the scenes and to kind of honor working out of Japan. We shot so much exterior stuff all through Tokyo and, and just, it just had an amazing time putting that together. But I, I wanted to make an, a, a segment in our eight chapter um, documentary on the making of Metal Gear 4 about Ryan and about his story, because I thought that would be very inspiring for English speaking uh, game fans that would dive into this material because he had emigrated. You guys know his story, but he'd gone to Japan and taught in Japan. And I thought, let's go to Ryan's house in Oregon, uh, no, in Vancouver, Washington, and meet his parents and his brother and interview his family about his journey. And so we put a whole sort of uh, slice of life piece into the doc as well. And I was really happy with the way that turned out. And it, it was really cool to kind of humanize this, you know, the story, which is, uh, you know, a little cold, a little tactical, a little uh, about, um, you know, the absence of humanity, I think. And 
it's an action experience, but then in the middle of it is all of this effort to try to find a spotlight on on just this tremendous human creativity that it takes to build something like that. Yeah, man, that's that's, that's wild here and the the different links that you go to, to to put these things together. You know, if it's someone that might just see it and it's like, okay, that's like a two or three minute clip. It's like, no, we traveled to Washington and, and set that up. And, you know, it was cool seeing you set up at Konami too. Just like, you were just like, all right, time to set up my camera and set my mics up. All right, we're rolling. And just, you know, you just started shooting right there. It's just. And in some ways it, it, it kind of makes everything that I saw in eighth grade, like so much more. I don't know how to describe it, but it's a very cathartic feeling. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. One of the beautiful things that we we did on that project as well uh, and I don't, I haven't seen the new Kojima doc, so I don't know how much of that stuff is in there, but Ryan actually came to our studios in Vancouver with all of the behind the scenes material that they had been shooting around Metal Gear for years and years and years. And so we digitized all of that, talking about digitizing a lot of material. And that all ended up in the, um, in the document. Well, not all of it, but cuts from all of that material. Mm -hmm. And so it was a massive project. In the middle of that too, this is kind of in the weeds here, but we, I think we had, con we had made a decision, I think, to move from Avid to Final Cut Pro mm -hmm. at that time, right in the middle of this project. And it, it just, it took all of our efforts to edit it together. And there, you know, there's like a, uh, I, I, like a tw 24 hour plus time difference or something. Uh, it's huge time difference. And yeah. so we were just up around the clock sending stuff to them to approve. And, you know, the internet was much slower then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sending video files. Yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, to, to complete the project, we had to send one of our production assistants because we got it right down to the final, final minutes, you know. We had to send one of our production assistant people or producer on a plane to LA to hand deliver the master disc to Ryan, who was taking it back to Japan so that, that the, um, the Sony Blu-ray uh, team could start um, mass producing it. And it was just, it was like the Death Star plans, you know, like it just came down to the, to the 11th hour. It was crazy. But it was a tremendous amount of work and, and um, I'm very, very proud of it. And... Uh, uh, yeah, something I'll, I, I may forget some of the names, but, uh, I, I will never forget that experience, man. That yeah. was incredible. Oh man, you're not expected to know all the names after, I mean, you've been doing this, you know, covering games for two decades now over, you know, it's just like, it, it's impressive yep. the the catalog of work you've done. So just all these stories that I'm sure you've got are just, you know, it's, it's awesome to hear. So don't worry about the oh, names. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I find it it's it's tougher for me to kind of remember like even story beats in in games, you know, mm -hmm. and how this connects with that game. Like I've played thousands of games at this yeah. point. I've reviewed hundreds and hundreds of games. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's there's a lot of stacked narratives in my brain, and then <laughs> yeah. I, I've met a lot of those people along the way that have made a lot of these things. And yeah, I've I've. Uh, I had this crazy dream in in uh, the you know in the mid '90s that that I think people would like to watch a TV show that that travels the world and talks to these people that make video games and and somehow we did that and people did like the show and I got to you keep doing right. it. Yeah, I was, yeah, was right. I was right, correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, speaking of Metal Gear, I mean, we've got Delta on the way. I mean, is is there any uh, direction you'd like to see it go from here? Or? Yeah, I I didn't hate on the Master Collection as much as the internet wanted to. Mm -hmm. I thought it was cool that you could load it onto your machines. I've been playing it a little bit on my my Steam Deck and and my uh, PlayStation Five. And yeah, I wish it ran a little better and it looked a little cleaner. I I honestly I feel like Konami should reconcile with Kojima, and Kojima should um, supervise a remake of Metal Gear Solid 1. And that should be entrusted to an incredible studio. And they should start again. And Kojima should, in a very public way, hand the baton to another director who loves the franchise. And they, and I maybe it's going to be the Delta team. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to turn out. Have you guys played it yet? Any Delta? No. No, that's not. No. Yeah, that's not accessible to us. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that cool, but thank you. Yeah. What do you know, Victor? Hey, you know where I am, Konami. If you want, if you want someone to play Delta ahead right. of time. 
Give me a shout. He only yeah. needs five yeah, minutes. Yeah, this Victor guy has, has good ideas, you know? <laughs> do you think um do you think he would go back to that though? Given given Fizzent and, and that recent announcement? Uh no, I mean he's got his plate full. I think I it's gonna be crazy to see him do all of the things that he's got. But I think Kojima could supervise another team that he trusts and respects. Maybe it's gonna be the Delta team if they really pull that off. Uh, but I, I feel like, and I, I, three is the best game as far as I'm concerned. Three is an incredible experience. And the, uh, um, the snake eater edition, which, which was the one where they kind of tuned the controls and, and fixed it. So you could, uh, subsistence. Subsistence. the subsistence controls. Yeah. That's kind of like, I'm excited to play the, the flashier one, you know, but subsistence was pretty damn freaking awesome as it was. Yeah. And and it's still great today to play that. So it's going to be great to play Delta if it's as fun and awesome to play as Subsistence was. But I do feel it's a little unnecessary in the context of what they could have done. They could have even gone back to the NES and remade those adventures in full 3D. Yeah. And that would have been really rad. But if Delta is great, then maybe, perhaps there can be some public reconciliation and a bit of a, a, you know, handing the keys to the kingdom to a new team because it's insane in a lot of, you know, largely the same way that it's also a, a little absurd that Harrison Ford is going to not bequeath Indiana Jones to anybody else. Not that it's up to him, but that character is so incredible and I love Harrison Ford and they're my favorite movies, but it would be really rad if we knew that there was a new indie that we all agreed on could could handle that and could, could keep making cool new indie movies. And it's equally absurd that this beautiful franchise <laughs> is is you know, except for this remake of three, is kind of just sitting there. You know, yeah. like we really could have new Metal Gear games and you know side missions, and we could get to know the other characters in their own games. Um, you know, what's taken so long with this film? Yeah. Or a TV show or something like that. Like, the, it's a beautiful property. We all know that. And a lot could be done. And why why it isn't being done is because I think there's a little timidness to do it without Kojima. Yeah. And I think there's a, a great hush has fallen over the world. We're all sort of sitting there and anticipating, are, are these guys going to pull it off yeah. with Delta? We don't know, right? We don't know. But hopefully they do. And maybe it, it, it's the beginning of of some really wonderful things. Sounds like you're cautiously optimistic. I I, I live at that speed. <laughs> I am cautiously optimistic. How could I not be? Look yeah. at all the things I've been able to do. You know, like <laughs> I, I I am very grateful and and yes, I'm very optimistic for for uh, companies. And then I'm um, often, uh, d you know, disappointed, like with Suicide Squad recently. But um, <laughs> I hope for the best, man. I think people yeah. get out of bed with such you know, joy in their heart to make us feel something and build the entertainment for us that we're going to care about. It doesn't I, it, always work. It reminds me of a phrase. I, I like to think of this phrase when when things like Suicide Squad happen, and that is assume good intent. Um, exactly. I mean, yeah. I, you know, they can only do so much as far as the live service element, but there are some folks out there who 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 did honest work and yeah. and it's it sucks that they're in this situation but it is what it is yeah and i'm sure there's still fun to be had in that game you know it's not just like zero out of ten you know like there's stuff to do but then it's like okay this gets grindy this gets this what you know like I, i've seen some takes on it that aren't as nuclear it's just like all right yeah i mean it's it's fine it's not well, timing you know. can be a, an issue too yeah i mean it's uh, right now that game coming out you know if that would have come out a few years ago might have done a little better i don't know but we're kind of at that end of the where everybody's kind of tired of that genre. Whereas it's, it's like when Metal Gear Survive came out, like I remember everybody was so sick of like just survival games at that point. And then that comes out and yeah. everybody's just like, damn it. Like, <laughs> And that's just another one of many reasons why the g current gaming industry is very <laughs> unsustainable. You can't have like having seven year projects yeah. and trying to follow trends is mm -hmm. mutually exclusive. Yeah, totally. Yeah, especially when you, you, it dates it too. Yeah. That's probably part of what's driving sort of the the prevalence of 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 remakes uh, over the past several years. Uh, everyone's sort of chasing that down. I'm cool with that though, because you know, oftentimes the 
not with everything, not everything has to be remade, but oftentimes these great ideas just didn't have the technological architecture to really show them off, you know? And we we got something that is a little less than, you know? Like I just played Rebirth and it's incredible. And it, it absolutely justifies its existence, even though the first game can still be played with a lot of fun and joy. Mm -hmm. It's great to play Remake and Rebirth. Um, and Resident Evil 2 or 4 last year, 2 was excellent too, but 4 was superb. And Metroid Prime Remastered, even though it's not a remake, was one of the most fun experiences I had playing video games in 2023. And not only are you serving the crowd that loves this stuff, but you're also bringing it to a, a person mm -hmm. that may not have experienced it the first time. And I'm totally cool with that. I Not so cool with The Last of Us Part 1 being remade after the <laughs> remaster had come out. Yeah. But I did like Last of Us Part 2 and adding Grounded and only charging 10 bucks for people that already had... Uh, the original PS4 game. Um, but y y we also don't want that to only be the way that uh, that companies think. We don't just want remakes. Yeah. Yeah. As, as much fun as the Resident Evil remakes have been, I would love for them to release a classic collection that lets me play the originals. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I'm dude. sure that's coming. Yeah, just the availability of the of having the old ones out still too. It's like you know, let's let's yeah. not just take that away and and only have the remake available. I mean, that's that's when you get into this whole just, just emulate it type discussion. Yeah, that 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 quagmire. Um, I can't remember if it was. I think it was Medieval that actually came with the original game, the remake of it. Yeah, I, I remember uh, that as well. And I wish more games would do that. Yes. Well, the Laura Cro or the Tomb Raider. You can snap in, in and out of the remastered and the original version, and it's fun to watch like speedrunners and challenge runners do that. I, I thought that it was well, the right? flashlight yeah, the going on. I was streaming it the other day, and I didn't even notice <laughs> that it was <laughs> that the graphics had improved because I was just like trying to find out where I was going. Because that's the thing with those old Tomb Raider games is like you have no idea where you are and yeah. everything is brown <laughs> and you're just lost. And so I was I pressed the start button and I thought, oh, I just turned on the light. But no, I had turned it back in time to the crappy textures. <laughs> but I could see more all of a sudden. I was like, oh, OK, I thought this is a flat. And it took me like 15 minutes and I went, wait a second. No, everything looks like crap. Yeah. OK, I see what they've done here. <laughs> that's the cool. genuine experience right there. I remember playing that back in the day like, where the hell am I supposed to? Oh, that's a rock climbable thing. OK, I need my yellow paint. What the hell? Like, this is <laughs> <laughs> I need my yellow paint. No, that game did. So, I and I hate that feeling of like, where the fuck am I supposed to be going? Like, I, oh, I, totally, I and man. just like running around an area. I'm just, you know, they're like, oh, it's right there. It's this little crevice thing that I was supposed to crawl in. Damn it! Like, I don't know. It was probably made by seven people that yeah. game, <laughs> and, and uh, we reviewed that. That was that was our. We we didn't air that review because we aired in '97 was our first episode, but mm. and I think that came out in '96. We shot a. Uh, a promo or a demo of the show and so we did a reviews on the run of tomb raider and we compared it to mario we did we i think crash bandicoot like we just picked some big titles right around that time and, and we reviewed it and i did not like the tank controls back then i was really entranced by super mario 64 it really felt like the future and uh, you just felt much more connected to the character, it, which also is a bit creaky to play now and trying to convert the, you know, re reconcile the cameras in 2024 in Super Mario 64. But it felt way like leaps and bounds more organic for me. But um, we did appreciate how cool and, and groundbreaking Tomb Raider was. And in one of our early episodes, we had our director um, take the camera. He was traveling in the UK alone. I don't even know what the hell he was doing out there, but he went to core and actually interviewed all the people. He just kind of looks like he just busted in the door and started rolling on everybody. <laughs> but it was uh, it was pretty funny. We have, a, we have a segment where they're just walking around interviewing all the people that are making, I think they were doing Tomb Raider 2 at that time which was pretty cool. I, I love surprising people with who, who haven't played the original like early Tomb Raiders before with how hard they are. Because, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. During lockdown, I, I ran a, a thing called Mystery Tournament where we would make people like compete on random games. And That's a great best, idea. One of, the, one of the best ones was the Tomb Raider Assault course and, and making people like race each other on the course because people... <laughs> Like if you've never if if you were you were either like either you played those games and you got good at them or you are 
you have a long road ahead of you because it's so difficult to get to grips with. Yeah, I haven't gone back and tried it, <laughs> but... I was I kind of rage quit on my stream the other day. Actually, I was. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Jumps are hard. Screw this! I'm gonna play something. <laughs> We've come a long way. Remember, there was all those systems for like doing like handstands off of the cliff and doing the dive and stuff. Yep. It, was, it was a pretty complex control system for back then, for sure. Yep. I just, totally. I just remember one and the first game. I'm probably remembering this incorrectly. And the first game, getting Laura killed by stupidly jumping on a, uh, I was going to say Medusa, King Midas's statue's hand. Oh, um, right. <laughs> and I remember in the sequels, locking the butler yeah. in the fridge. I hated, oh, yeah. I hated him so much. He creeped me out as a kid. <laughs> you could spend hours in that house just like messing around, just parkour. So much brilliant stuff. Yeah. I, I I actually love the Tomb Raider franchise. I love what Crystal D did when they picked up the baton and and kept going with it. I think that's possible for Metal Gear guys. How do you guys feel? Do you think that somebody else should touch that, or should it live and die with with uh, Kojima? Who wants to take it? <laughs> oh boy! <clears throat> oh wow! I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me personally. I I'm just I'm I'm always open to having new experiences with it. You know, I I was one of the few Metal Gear Survive fans. Like I I kind of saw what they were trying to accomplish with it. You know, and just had fun mm -hmm. with friends doing the the multiplayer and stuff. And uh, anything in the Metal Gear universe, I'm kind of you know I'm down for at least trying out. You know, so I I I'd, yeah. I'd love to see them take on either new characters or connect some of the dots in the timeline. You know, there's there's plenty of events that we know happened, so we wouldn't have to yep. change the script or add too much to it, but just like, you know, let's see some of these things played out, and you could even have it kind of be like a, you know, here's a quick mission with this group, here's another one, and you kind of hop around the timeline. I, I don't know. I, I'd be excited to see it do anything, really. I think there's definitely room to explore the mechanics in the world and the ideas, you know, I've been I've been saying for a while that I wish Metal Gear had sort of a an expanded universe equivalent, sort of like Star yeah. Wars does. Um, yep. And I've always liked the weird experiments. Like one of my favorite Metal Gears is, is Ghost Babble on the Game Boy Color. Mm. Okay. And it's 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 phenomenal. I could I can't believe that's a Game Boy game. It's it plays so well. It's it's sort of like a it's the best Game Boy Color game. Yeah, it's, it's like a Metal Gear three that never was, you know. Um, yeah, the, like the NES game. Yeah, but it's I would like to see them go in different directions. Like, it, we don't need to keep adding on to the story that's there. Right. Um, it, it was already running out of runway like three games ago. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> the, uh, the, the Raiden one. The, oh, the yeah, Rising. Rising. Yeah. 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 And do you call it, do you say Raiden or Raiden? Raiden. Raiden. Yeah. Raiden. Yeah. That game was great. That was Platinum. Yeah, no, yeah, that was a that was a great action game. Like that's and that's when people are like, "Oh, this isn't Metal Gear enough." It's like, okay, but you know, I used to say like Mario Kart doesn't have enough platforming. It's like that's a bad argument. Like they're trying to do something different yeah. here. It doesn't have sure, to stick sure. to this yes. strict formula. And it uh, it did kind of exhale the, the 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 universe of of Metal Gear a little bit. You know, it just kind yeah. of it, it sort of rippled out a little bit with some interesting ideas in that, that concept. It was really fun, man. Platinum mm -hmm. would actually be an interesting an interesting choice to pick up the baton. Do you guys play Astral Chain on the on the Nintendo Switch? I did not, but no, I was I, I've seen I a bit of it. I didn't play Astral Chain on the Nintendo Switch, but I played the wonderful one on one on the Wii U with like <laughs> seven other people. Yeah, and then they, they brought that back. They actually have another wonderful 101 game. I forget the name of it, and I've been playing it on the Steam Deck recently, and it's uh, it's kind of like a twin-stick Metroidvania, um, and it's really cool, and nobody's talking about it. I, I haven't played much of it, so I can't like give a review on it, and I can't even remember the title of it. It's a little convoluted, but it is a wonderful 101 experience. But Platinum is such a cool company, and... Uh, uh, Astral Chain was the game of the year. I think, what was that year? Was that 2019 that that came out? That's an incredible game, you guys. If you all have Switches, mm. um, I know we're inundated with great things to play right now, but I can't recommend that game to you enough. It is such a fantastic, cool game. You're controlling giant mechs, you know, sort of like Metal Gear Solid-like um, or Metal Gear-like. 
Um, at their sort of, you're, you're transitioning in between different dimensions and you've got all of these cool abilities. You're also doing like these, uh, like a, a, a sort of a Kira cop show as well. Like there's an, an aesthetic there where you're an, a detective cruising around this, this futuristic Tokyo and, uh, you get caught up in some sort of political intrigue in it, but it's, it's platinum. So it's just, you know, bulletproof in terms of its controls and it's fun and it's constantly giving, you know, nice, cool, arcadey type rewards. Every battle that you get into is so freaking interesting and different. And yeah, no, they're a fun company. They've they've done some cool stuff. Uh, actually, I had fun with great, their yeah. uh, Ninja Turtles game that they did. Like that was just a you know, like they just they make good times. Like <laughs> I don't know, that, and that's for me. It's all about just like game feel and you know, just if exactly it, if it feels fun to play. And uh, it, yes, they do a good job at that. It's shocking that Rising never got a sequel, but maybe it was just the timing with uh everything that followed shortly after yeah yeah was that was um, that after four mm -hmm. yeah yeah I can't and, it was it, yeah yeah they actually had to had to scrap their original concept which would have been a, a an interquel between two and four and then they went back i guess kojima productions was developing it in-house it was going to be a lot more serious and you know the that uh, you've probably seen that that metal gear solid rising footage that's uh you know a little more grim dark i i uh, haven't actually i haven't or if i did oh. it's been a long time and I, I, I it was it recently released uh no no it was it was when they first announced the game at the Xbox conference. Um, okay, so I would have seen it probably and then yeah. <laughs> totally forgotten about it. But <laughs> and um, I guess they just uh, when they talked about it, you know, they they kept trying to make something that would work and it just wasn't fun. So they went to Platinum and said, "Can you help us?" I think for most people, it was just like, cool, there's a trailer for something called Rising. And then all of a sudden it was like, cool, it's another trailer for something called Rising. And just like the name switch probably didn't even like click for most people. It's just yeah. like, oh, there's that game that they were working on a long time ago. I'm glad to see it's doing well. <laughs> like, Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, I remember be, really enjoying Metal Gear Rising. That's a really cool game. Yeah, it would be great to see Platinum take another crack at it or just other developers in general sort of. Even if it's not the same story, just sort of run with it and and see what weird stuff comes out like. Um, You're so Yoko right. Man. Would be a would be a wild one to see. Try a Metal Gear. What or, do they do? Or maybe Yoko Taro with a yeah. Nier. Oh yeah. Well, that's yeah. Platinum as well, isn't it? Um, he's at Square, but but they worked with with Platinum on that. Like, actually, okay. I would love to see Yoko Taro do Zone of the Enders. Ooh. That would be amazing. I, oh my god. I just don't. I just don't get how Ryzen doesn't get a second game. Like, yeah, it's like, bizarre. It's strange. It's so strange. It did so well. Like, think of Kojima. all the Metal Gear games that, like, or, or stuff that across the series that, like, wasn't that well received, but still got a second game. And you've like, set the tone already of like this batshit grindhouse mood. You know, like you can just you can just go wherever with it. Like you, you know, yeah. fuck the kid yeah. in. Like it's just you know, have fun. Like, and that's what that game did. Yeah. You're making me want to play that again right now. <laughs> I hear it plays well on the Steam. I, I loved it when I played it. I thought I had so much fun with that game, and I haven't played it since then. It was very cool. I need to play the DLC. Kojima tried to get a second one made. He yeah. did he? He made okay. a yeah. He suggested a concept to Platinum, and they just didn't bite. He wanted him to do a a, a Gray Fox game, basically a Rising Two with Gray Fox, except he's fighting nano machine zombies. So cool. And they were just like, uh, we'll get back to you. Yeah, I think Platinum ha has felt the uh, the pinch on doing other people's games, you know, like, and that's why you, I, I can't recommend Astral Chain enough. It's an excellent game, but they I, were really pivoting to trying to celebrate their own stuff and self-publishing, like things like the wonderful 101. Um, and to, to varying degrees of success, the uh, Kamiya has left the studio. Um, I've been to... I, that was actually one of the last trips that I did before the pandemic was go to to uh, Osaka and visit uh, uh, Platinum. And that that was like a dream come true for me because I love that studio and they were so cool in there. And that whole setup was very Kojima-esque. Kamiya Sam was uh, showing me all of the arcade boards that he collected <laughs> and he has as big oh, a toy collection cool. as I have. <laughs> and it was, it was dope, man. That was a really, really fun trip. And I, I, I hope... Nothing for nothing but the best for that studio because they've made so many games that I absolutely adore. I wasn't a huge fan of uh, uh, Bayonetta 3. I thought that was quite disappointing. It'd yeah. probably be a lot better on more sophisticated hardware than, a, than the Switch, but I felt it very restrained and contained relative to how 
groundbreaking one and two were. Yeah. Um, but th- they've done a lot of great things, though. Such a cool, such a cool company. Kami has got one of the most solid bodies of work of any game developer yes. of all time. <laughs> like it's, he's just got hits. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Seems like a bit of a firecracker online, but um, a little bit. I, I, I like him a lot. I think you got to have a, a bit of an e- ego with this stuff, you know. Like if you're really going to go out there and and shake it up and and uh, draw the attention, you kind of have to. Like Shinji Mikami, we did the making of Evil Within with Bethesda and visited his team and his studio. Tango is incredible as well. And there is this aura around these individuals mm-hmm. and they cultivate it and they they need to be that figurehead persona. And uh, it's it serves the projects, you know, like the, and it's also a totally different mystique and culture than America. And it's different than the, the culture that we would find in Canada where I'm based. And that's okay, you know, and maybe we're not supposed to understand it, but it works to, uh, to have a little bit of that, you know, I think there's a little bit of fear on the, on the part of the team members. Like they don't want to disappoint their, their leader. Mm-hmm. And I think that's okay. You think that that like the size of the personality sort of also acts as a ballast against games ending up being sort of like designed by committee? Uh, yeah, I think that there's an auteur quality um, to kind of guide the ship, you know, because these are huge, massive things. And I don't know so much if it's a design by committee, because I think what inevitably happens is it's a discussion between artists and programmers determining what actually can hit frame rates, you know, what, what yeah. how much stuff can we throw into this world before it starts to break and fall apart and not be fun? And it is a, it's a, uh, a, an ongoing battle of concession. And I think when you have a leader sort of steering the whole thing, it's just an easier endeavor to try to get behind that, that concept. Cause that's what they're doing. Right. And, and you guys know, like video games come together in the last three months or six months or something like that. You know, except if you're Nintendo, who starts with a playable gray box and plays that for two years and makes right. that super fun. And, it, and then they go, Hey, we should add some colors to this. So, you know, <laughs> what kind of weird thing are we going to have that's doing this jumpy and squishy thing? And then they come up with the character and they put that in and you know, they're different than everybody else out there. It's like they make, they're a toy factory at Nintendo. They make these, these interactive toys yeah. that then they add the paint to. Whereas everybody else, I think, works the other way. They they add all the 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 character designs. They go to out house uh, out of house um, concept artist firms, and and they just go gangbusters on like the story and the and the beautiful reach and ambition of all of our stuff. And then they try to squeeze the game in that direction, and that's really freaking hard. It's impossible, actually, and so we should always remember that whenever we pop one of these things into play, because it's just impossible that they come together. It, it's crazy to me that Nintendo can still come out of nowhere with something that'll shake everything up and blow your mind. Yeah, I know. I know. I, when I saw Splatoon for the first time, I was like, I don't want anything to do with this squirt gun game. This looks ridiculous. This is for babies. And then, you know, flash forward to it coming out. It's like, God damn, this is fun. How do they do this? This is such a ridiculously goofy game. I love Splatoon, but like if you try to get into those servers nowadays, you will get your shit kicked in. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, I'm not super hyper competitive. I just love the mechanics of it. That's the way they do it. They're magicians that way. Yeah. And they'll sit on a mechanic that, you know, they'll come up with something in like 83 and then they'll just hold it. I'm still reeling from Tears of the Kingdom, honestly. Yeah, that was too much of a good thing, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was I was done with it because Breath of the Wild is my favorite game, and uh, it's not so much about the retraversing everything. It's just like there was just too much game in Tears. I was just like, come on, man, just <laughs> let me go. I, I want to play other things. Can I stop? Can I finish this yeah, game? It's that good. Let me go. Yeah. It, n- never mind. <laughs> God, where do you come even on? Go what was it? Though? You can't leave us like that. I was just the way that you described <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom. It 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 was the same way 
my little heart broke. Uh, we keep on going back to my past. Or we keep on going back to nostalgia. It's kind of weird. But uh, it gave me the same vibes as when I watched you tear apart <laughs> one of my favorite games of all time. <laughs> oh, what was it? <laughs> it was Super Smash Brothers Melee. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I... I in that episode was, i just like okay i just sorry let me let me preface this by saying it's not just melee though it was like every time you didn't like a game it was like like your dad saying i'm not mad i'm just disappointed <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's like oh my gosh. That, that review almost felt like i was like man are they are they messing around? Like, did they mean to give it a 10 out of 10? They were like, obviously this is great, but yeah, let's, let's go out here and give it a three out of 10. It was just like, <laughs> Victor, Tommy, what are y'all doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we didn't get it. Cause I mean, you guys remember we were reviewing dead or alive in that same episode and dead or alive had destructible environments and, it was just like punishing beautiful, elaborate violence. And it's it just a dedicated, beautiful control system. And, and, Smash Brothers felt like you're smashing the button and you're, you're putting these these mascot characters. It just felt incongruous to us and we just didn't understand it. it took me like three iterations of that franchise before I was like, oh, I I see. It is yeah. about it's a, but there's a lot of subtlety and it is about collecting all of these different characters and every freaking character that's ever even just stepped into a Nintendo world is in this freaking game. <laughs> and then I got it, but I didn't, I really did not get it the, the first couple of times at all. It was like, okay, I, I, if it looked like a game for little kids. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like a fighting game. It seems like it, it, like if you compare it to other fighting games and what we knew of as fighting games, it's yes. nothing like that. It's somewhere in between a party game. I was about to say a party game. game. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially like the N sixty four one for sure. Like that one didn't really click with me. But by the time Melee came around, I was like, this is pretty damn tight. Like you know, the 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 system that's here is is very fun. And and we used to have people over all the time, and we'd set up sixteen player tournaments and stuff. You know, it was just we played the shit out of that game. You know, it was, it it was hit. a great time. Yeah. So it hit. Credit where credit is due. If I had to like initially review it by my first experience or first impression i would probably be bewildered as well I, I remember starting melee and you know switching it from percentage to hp because i just didn't get the concept of getting like smashed yeah. out and then once i got that you know i just spent hours into that shit just hours and it's so funny that it, dead or alive was also in that same episode because like i would switch between dead or alive too and <laughs> And, and melee, so yeah, uh, good times, good times. It, they, those were incredible times, and you know what? I mean, like you, we can't all just like everything, you know. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And, sure. Uh, for sure. And that's what makes the discussion around this this industry so much fun, you know. And and the, these different kinds of takes and different kinds of things that we get into and these different risks that these developers create for us is yeah. is what keeps us going with all of it, you know? So like with, with things like Judgment Day, I mean, were, were you guys sitting down and writing those scripts out yourself or, you know, was that, was that like primarily? No scripts. Uh, or, okay, yeah. No scripts. We would play them and, you know, we'd play them for as long as we could mm -hmm. and to, to get to a point where we knew how we felt about them and then, uh, and then we would get together and shoot them and we wouldn't converse about what we were going to say until the camera rolled. Ooh, and so everything that you sorry, watched, yeah, it was all real time. It was all just a real honest back and forth on all of this stuff. And, yeah. and we shocked and surprised each other, but it wasn't acted, you know, like, no, that's, that's really cool to know. Like that, that, that was pretty much all just improv and you guys didn't let each other know the take. So nope. it was like a real exactly. reaction and, you know, in time. So no, that, that makes it a lot cooler knowing that that was the process of it, you know? Yeah. we were shocked often, you know, and, and, um, either one of us would get a little upset every once in a while, yeah. uh, Tommy more than me usually. Uh, but that's fine. You know, and the thing that, that, uh, uh, people, there's a couple things Like people like to say that I like too many things or I'm, I'm too soft on games. And I think what I, I really want people to understand is that if I wasn't a fan of a lot of different types of games, the electric playground would not have come together. It never would have been a show that got put together. Mm -hmm. I love the business and lots and lots of different types of things. 
And that love, you know, like I, before EP, I would go out and buy, I don't know, three, I would spend 300 bucks a month on video games. And I had all the machines and I would buy games of every kind of style for, I'd buy the Sims or a Sim City for Super Nintendo. And I'd buy a, a Garfield game for the Genesis or something mm -hmm. like that. Every type of thing you could think of. I had all yeah. the handhelds and all that stuff. And that's what I brought to it. And I'll, I just this, this obsession of reading all the magazines and knowing who the people were and, yeah. you know, knowing what I knew to my limits about the business. And then Tommy had all of the insider stuff because he actually worked with the game companies and was doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he had very specific tastes. And so we would um, rub up against each other. And the same thing when, when I started working with uh, 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 Scott and with other co-hosts mm -hmm. uh, along the way as well. Like we, we all had our own kind of take on it, but I have a pretty broad interest across a lot of different um, genres and a lot of different things. That's what makes for a, a good show, you know, and, and having those conflicting, you know, this, if everybody's just like, I like it, it's great, I love it too, awesome, great, great show, yeah, guys. Exactly. Like, you know, it's like you need those conflicting, well, I think it sucks, you know, <laughs> it's just, and sometimes you just have that, and that's, you know, what I loved about this show too, like, we all just have different opinions on this stuff, but that, you know, it doesn't mean we have to just fight about it all day, it's just like, we're like, okay, well, that's how you feel about it, so that's fine. Oh, man, man, yeah. I wish more people in the world could could wrap their head around that yeah. idea right now, huh? Like, we're all just fighting each other for for nothing <laughs> people you know <laughs> just so, people weird question uh what made y'all decide where you would because one of my favorite things about judgment day is that it just seemed like y'all just got plopped in these random places um yep. what was the process in finding these places did you just kind of go in and ask these businesses hey we really like your barber shop. Let's uh, <laughs> can we shoot here? <laughs> can we shoot here? Or, hey, yeah, we, we like would. This? Oh my god, that's great! <laughs> <laughs> it's you. It was usually me walking in, and my my big uh, chipmunk cheeks. I'd have a big smile for them, and, and I'd talk to them about uh, you know. I'd I'd try to disarm them and let them know that we were kind and gentle people, and we were just going to come in and <laughs> and be goofy. <laughs> we we weren't going to disrupt their space too much. Sometimes it kind of sucked, to, honestly, to shoot in in businesses. Yeah, it, there were it was a plus and minus, but we we definitely had to consider how animated we could get and be and how noisy we could be um if we were shooting in a comic store or something like that because we didn't want to make it a terrible experience for the customers that were yeah. in the store but yeah people were definitely receptive to our antics and we knew i mean i knew right from the beginning like it's such a sedentary medium it's just about sitting in front of screens and whether you're making them or playing them it was so important to the quality of the show to be out in the world and to mm -hmm. talk with people and, and do things like Kelly Benson was interviewing streeters in the very first season, walking up to people who had no idea about, about these video games that we were getting into. But we, it was fun to like get these honest reactions. And then we'd go to these different studios. And if we didn't like this setup inside the studio, we'd say, well, let's go shoot outside. You know, let's go to the park. Is there a park here? We got kicked out of uh, uh, parking lots all the time, <laughs> you know, from the security guards that would be roaming the building. Hey, you can't shoot here without a permit, you know, and you yeah, don't have so many permits. Like, Did you need to get yeah, these people? <laughs> yeah. But we, sometimes we work those squabbling security people in we would change their voice or you know blur their face or something like that <laughs> and we just we just roll on it and stick it in the show it makes for good pleasure like oh we gotta roll <laughs> yeah we we had many many times where we asked for forgiveness rather than permission um but you know people also then became quite aware of what we were doing and would extend an offer to come and shoot at their location and one of the cool ones that i remember is a there's a, a place in vancouver here called save on meats which is a quite famous um, meat store in the middle of downtown and they've got this beautiful um, iconic neon sign out front and I just called them up and said can we come and shoot in your meat locker and they were okay that's weird but yeah you can do you can, you can come and shoot in your, our oh meat God. locker and so we shot a bunch of violent game reviews in a meat locker and just put it in that's and it, it, it worked out pretty good <laughs> but that was the that was the like we wanted to make it a fun thing to make as well, yeah. right? It wasn't just sitting in the studio, like in the same backdrop every time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and honestly, like 
that's what I've seen over and over again from other things that have tried to do what we were doing or, you know, had their own take on it, but there's just too much sitting on your butt, you know, yeah. and I call it kind of, and, and too many people and, and cue cards everywhere and everything is so clenched. Yeah. And, uh, right. It's all curated now. Nobody wants to, to step out of line. Not enough chaotic energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but there's or the other end of it is that the you know people are trying to be as shocking as possible to get those mm -hmm. clicks and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know. We we came at it from um, a, a place of reverence and irreverence, and uh, and we wanted to play with everybody, and we wanted people to kind of tune in and have a you know learn stuff, but have a smile on their face and and. Uh, Hopefully we entertained them and, and uh, showed them something they'd never seen before. And I think almost every episode we, we could say we did that. I think you did, man. I mean, especially hearing all these, just the attention to detail and just the passion that you have for, for making this content. You know, it's not just like, all right, set up the camera, you know, do whatever. You know, you, you really did go the no. extra mile. It's, it's very Kojima-esque of you, you know, in your own field to be, <laughs> to be doing it that way. You know, it's, 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 it's been an honor to have you on the show. And just it's, it's awesome. We were talking earlier how you're, you're going to be bringing all the episodes back onto YouTube. Is that right? Yeah, that's the the plan that I've been wanting to do for a while, but it took a, we did a deal with a university in Canada called the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and they had collected a huge library of um, video game, um, actual cartridges and discs and things from different eras from a, a gentleman who sadly passed away. His name is Sid Bolton. And um, they he had a computer and video game museum in Ontario, and they had collected that. And then my friend and and uh, former co-star or co not star co-host on the uh, on the shows, Scott Jones, had helped the school and Sid's widow kind of make that relationship and that deal happen. And then Sid, uh, Scott suggested to the school that they should talk with me. Maybe the archive of video assets that we have would be something attractive for them. And when we got to talking about it, it absolutely became that because we had something very singular. Like we spent all of our production money, not just to make a show with us as experts talking about this stuff, but we actually endeavored to get out and let these people speak for themselves about the work that they were doing. And that is a really interesting time capsule to siphon through and to go through. And so we did a deal. It's an education-based deal where the school has access to our video archive for their students. They have a game studies program that they just launched. And now they've got, I think, one of the biggest, yeah, one of the biggest archives in the world in this space with our video content and all of the Sid Bolton um, game collection. So an incredible amount of info for these game study students that will, will be coming in and they'll be learning about the history of games and they'll be able to, you know, z zip through our interviews and stuff. They have not, not only the more than 4,000 episodes that we shot, but also all, all of the raw footage, the, a, the a roll, we call it the, uh, the longer form interviews, the 20 minutes of combo that ends up becoming a four minute piece in a show. So they have all of that. And so I needed a partner that was gonna help me to digitize that and then get the actual pieces back to me so that we can start to uh, share that. And so that's exactly what's happening. On March 23rd, we're gonna start with episode one from 1997. Wow. And every Saturday at, at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, we will run a new episode and just go chronologically through the many, many years and, and epi many episodes <laughs> that we put out there. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'll be on, we're going to premiere them on YouTube so I can jump into the chat and we can watch them together and everybody can make fun of my sweater and my hair. And <laughs> oh my oh, I'm, so, I'm so down. <laughs> I'm I can't there. wait. I can't wait. I'm there. So let's say, man, that's a, that's a Saturday morning treat for everybody. Just like wake up and a time travel. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And like everybody else that we talked to, like Richard Garriott, Kojima is in there. Miyamoto's in our first episode, I think. And, you know, we met everybody, everybody along the way, Sid Meier and, and, um, Chris Taylor, actually a, a, a quick thing with Chris Taylor, who did the uh, Total Annihilation games and the Dungeon Siege games, uh, ran gas powered games, wonderful guy. Um, but he's in our first episode. And, you know, I, we, I, I, I didn't come from like broadcast school or a family that had made television or anything like that before. 
I just had this idea and I, you know, I thought that if I wanted to see it, other people would probably want to see it. But I actually sat in on the editing of, well, a lot of stuff, but I, on the specific one, this interview that I did with Chris Taylor, and as I was watching it come together, he was so funny and so smart and his game was so cool. This first kind of 3D real-time strategy game with huge explosions and he just explained it so emphatically and with so much passion i went all right this is gonna work this show is this is fun this is gonna this is gonna happen and uh and it and it and it did and it hit and then the next episode was uh the first thing that i ever caught was the interview with uh uh, uh doug to for for, for uh, skull monkeys he's the co-creator of um was that earthworm jim god i love that game yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, interesting dude, super funny guy. He's had a lot of controversial stuff that's happened to him recently, um, or he's been the the the, you know, done and said controversial things, and uh, you know, uh, whatever. But when we met him and we put him into the show, he was hilarious and a lot of fun. And I had yeah. my, my first cut was like twelve minutes long, <laughs> and. <laughs> And the and the director that we were working with at that time in that first season, he said we should just run that whole thing. I like, we can't run that whole thing. That's half the show. We have a twenty three minute show. We can't run a twelve minute segment, even though he's he's really funny and Tommy was hilarious in that piece too. So we had to cut that all down. But that was a great education. And um, yeah, as we started to see these things come together, it was like I think we're doing it. We're figuring this out. This is actually this is happening, guys. And uh, and lo and behold, we made 25 seasons of, of that show. Wow. Yeah, I, I do remember always, you know, growing up and be like, man, I wish there was a show that talked more about video games. It's not, you know, just Nick Arcade or, you know, like the, I, I get excited when I see my, my favorite video games show up and some of this stuff. But having someone break it down and, and show us what's coming out, you know, to have that on your on your cable TV or, you know, your satellite. It was uh, it was always cool to tune in. So. And for some of these oh. Zoomers out there, you have to know there was no YouTube. Like, no YouTube. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our shit was like Game Facts forums, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you weren't sitting in front of the TV when it was on, you just, you just missed it. Yep. Yeah. We, we had some crazy things happening in Canada because it was, it was Canadian um, content, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have an organization called the CRTC and, and there are rules that all the broadcasters have to abide by. Mm -hmm. And it's always been independent, but uh, we, we had secured a bunch of different stations and there was a time pre G4 um, where we had licensed DP to space, which was like the sci-fi channel, mm -hmm. MTV Canada, um there i think tech tv i was about to say was it, it on become, tech tv because i remember that that transition it from was tech in TV canada to okay gotcha it, it was in canada um and then we were also on regular stations on the dial but there were saturdays and sundays in canada where you could just be it was surreal like it was on seven stations or something like that wow. you'd just be clicking on the dial and there we were on this station then you click again there we are on that station you click again there we are on that station yeah. and then g4 we did another we did a deal with uh, discovery science for our sixth and seventh seasons and so we were on that on that station through 2001 and interestingly the uh, the terrorist attack at uh, in new york and washington there, I mean, that's a whole other story, but that honestly changed our course of direction. Like we, we, we didn't continue with discovery science because of that, which is so weird to say, but it's, it's crazy. But then in 2002, that following year, G4 was launching, they were looking for shows. We already had seven seasons under our belt. And uh, I was also being courted by the, the sci-fi channel in America to, to kind of remake electric playground. Uh, under a new name and they wanted to hire me away and they wouldn't guarantee that I would be working with my team. And it's like, uh, I think I'm going to take this G4 deal. <laughs> and uh, we started a deal with G4 and, and um, we just kept kind of doing deals and growing and taking new opportunities. And eventually we went daily in 2008 with Electric Playground. And then 2010, we went daily with reviews on the run. That was in Canada. We still had EP running, I think, in the States. And uh, we just kept going. We just, you know, we were in this world working with not just game makers, but we wanted to get in on the creativity behind movies and animated shows and television shows and comic books and everything cool every yeah. single day. That was our motto. 
That's awesome, man. That's that's a good place to be. I get, I get why you don't want to uh, why you don't want to leave and why you don't want to stop. It's you know, <laughs> and like just congratulations yeah. on all the success and and pulling off all oh. those deals and you know. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a hard. I mean, you're you guys are in this now too. You know, you're all in the media. You're you're covering this world, and it's very seductive. It's very hard to <laughs> look around and not want to keep doing it. And that's <laughs> God. <laughs> I remember me and Nitroid had that moment and we were in LA. We looked at each other like, wait, are we a game journalist now? Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh no, th- that moment. Yeah. We had a couple moments like yeah. that. The one that was really funny is when you were, you were interviewing Ben, I believe, uh, while we were play testing the master collection. And then at one point we both sort of, we look back and we're like, are we on? Like, are, are we, <laughs> are we, yeah, on? we are, we You're should probably show. not, yeah. we should probably not look back. <laughs> I remember I yeah, I, I took a screenshot. We we were on the show. <laughs> you were on the show? Yeah. yeah. Uh Jesus, I missed that so much. That was such a great event to travel to. Oh, I mean, man, that was yeah. my life. Yeah. I, I was away from the house too much, but I loved it too, you know? And I would miss my wife. And now I have a baby. Well, she's not she's 12 now, but I would uh, you know, I'd be away and traveling and they're always my baby, yeah. And yeah. you know, visiting all these companies, and and I just haven't had that that cadence in a long time. And mm-hmm. I really, really would like to build to that again because it it was such it's, a such a unbelievable privilege. So fun. Is it harder to go out and do that and talk to these studios now than it used to be? Uh, I don't think so. I, I the the hard thing is that I, I one man band it now, right? I, I, yeah. I'm, a, yeah. I'm I'm on YouTube, so I don't. And and that really happened because of the pandemic. I had to kind of move into the basement, and 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 like no studio was going to have a visitor anyways during the pandemic. Um, I I just it now it is a uh, it, you have to ask. You know, and I don't know if everybody out there could get that access, but I think I could because I have a lot of friends and relationships with with yeah. uh, different companies, um, and I I do get some, but it's mostly I I don't do as much of it now because I just don't have the resources in, in terms of manpower or the time, and uh, the other the huge part of my work is to play these games and talk about them, and I know that it, it, especially with YouTube. Most people are watching YouTube to um, get a, a product review. You know, mm-hmm. they they want to know if they should buy this or not. And I I, I see the, the the utility of that. And, yeah. And it's a little reductive because I think we are losing that connection with game makers, and we've dehumanized that whole process. Mm. And it's it's a problem. And I think yeah. that. Um, we should, as a as a an industry, be doing more to celebrate the work of these human beings, these these uh, very talented people, and not just as a marketing video, because that just can't come off um, as uh, truly authentic. You know, mm-hmm. even the Kojima yeah. thing was felt like a marketing thing. I think for the most yeah. part, right? Yeah. Content is king, so there's not as much exploration now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I it, I don't. Personally, I think that I, if I had the platform to do more of it, I, I would be able to do more of it. But it probably would take a little more convincing and a little bit more, uh, um, you know, communication around all that stuff. But I'm kind of hoping that, you know, some interesting doors are opened by people paying attention to what we've done. And maybe we start to create a ripple out there that people start to think about how they cover the business in a slightly different way. Um, you know, who knows, who knows? I don't want to sound too trite or conceited around any of that stuff, but no, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. I mean, especially with all the, the negative coverage out there where, you know, a lot of people are just going to just, you know, hate on stuff to get the, the, the bait clicks and stuff like that. I know. You know you're out here just doing yeah. like a, a legit, you know, this is how I feel about it. And you're, you're coming at it with, with good faith. And that's, that's something that I really yep. appreciate with it. It's like, Hey, if you don't like it, then it's probably for a good reason or, you know, whatever, you've got your own reason for it. It's not just this hate infused, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I've been flipping in my career. You guys, will, if you watch the classic stuff, you'll see me just, you know, call something crap or whatever. But mm-hmm. I certainly over time really learned that nobody's going into these offices to make shit. Like they're really trying to, yeah. they're trying, you know, and I, I 
now, certainly now, I don't always remember it, you know, like I reviewed Madam Webb and it was really hard to. <laughs> Kojima saw it. That's all we, all we have to consider. Yeah. He, he saw it and that's, that's it. God. So don't feel bad. Do you, yeah. quick aside, do you think he's aware of how people, uh, he he's gotta, he's, he's gotta know. <laughs> yeah, he's seen he's that gotta know. Of like yeah. the paragraph of, of one movie and then saw this. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no way he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, I mean, he he knows he's got a, a, a cultural footprint out there, and yeah. it's just growing, and and uh, and more and more people are becoming aware of him, and it, that's as it should be. You know, we should know more and more. It it shouldn't just be isolated to Kojima-san. Yeah, but we need to start somewhere. You know, yeah. we need to get to know who these people are, and uh, that was my mission, guys. That was my Metal Gear mission. You know, like mm. go out. And find out who these people were and put them on TV, even if they really didn't want to be on TV. <laughs> talk to them and say, come on, you know, we're going to be fine. It's going to be, it, it, we're, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be respectful. And, yeah. and then they would see the show and they'd go, holy shit, I'm, I'm glad that I did that. <laughs> and, and now, guys, geez, I have people asking me for clips you know, and and uh, there's been a lot of impetuses for wanting to do this. And one of them, this is a little morbid, but, uh, you know, there's people passing away in the industry. And yeah. we were there interviewing and collecting these moments that no one else did. And so I've had people reach out and say, do you have a picture of this guy? Or do you have a, a clip of this or whatever? And it's like, yeah, we need to do that. We need to put that stuff out there, you yeah. know? And um, the other thing that, that we're kind of losing out on, I, do you guys know who Eugene Jarvis is? Hmm, not God, off. why does that ring a bell? Yeah. No. Well, he's a, he's a legend in the game industry, and he was somebody that I became aware of through uh, magazines, I think. Yeah, Defender, Smash TV. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Got your Google working? Yeah. You know, he... he <laughs> yeah, I'm looking him up too. I immediately Googled him. <laughs> he helped to define, like he created the twin stick shooter. Yeah. And that has been utilized with Robotron and it, that's been utilized so many times. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do work with the Vancouver Film School here. They have a great game design program here where, where students go through the course and learn how to make games. And then they inevitably get hired at lots of cool studios. But every year I go and look at the students' work and it's there's a twin stick shooter, and I every year I say, yeah, that's cool. You, you fan of Eugene Jarvis? You know who? He, and nobody knows, you know. Mm, and yeah. I I think we're we're effing that up too as an industry. Like we can't we cannot. I mean, if, I, we'll just look at the way that preservation is just complete. There's the word. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's crazy, <laughs> right? R.I.P. Yuzu. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I could. I could talk your ear off about preservation. <laughs> I'm not big on this Yuzu thing, though. I don't think that's cool. I think that uh, what would be cooler is Nintendo uh, seeing the business case for it and developing a platform within platforms to sell their software yeah. in different places. Yeah. No, Yuzu messed up. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that, uh, you know, emulation is a... Um, a bridge to preserving this stuff right now. And I think it's incumbent on the industry in total to do a way better job to help protect this software and yeah. make it accessible for people. That's what's cool about the university, actually, because they, they've got a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to be able to open a lot of that to uh, uh, the students for sure. But then I think they'll probably come up with some kind of showcase for some of this material down the road where the public can come and test out some of these classic games and stuff, which is great. It does seem like it's going to come down to just the players to kind of archive this stuff. I mean, what's that stat? It's like 80% of, you know, games are unplayable or uh, not unplayable, but, you know, you can't purchase them in a legal way. So it's just like, you know, and, and yeah. none of the companies are really yeah. doing anything. So it's like, well, at least we got this on archive every year for the people that... Well, well on that note, are you familiar with the Video Game History Foundation? You probably are. I mean, that's a I am, yeah. question. Yeah. Those guys are doing some amazing work. I can't see, wait to see what this interactive archive they've been working on is going to look like. Yeah, they're they're doing some really good stuff out there. And then there's the uh, museum out in New York, which I haven't been to. And then there's the video game museum in Dallas as well. And, and uh, yeah, oh, some, I, some sorry, really... I, I love I love the <laughs> Dallas video game museum. I love seeing Princess Daisy's dress and they're so cool. They're yeah. so such cool. Have you guys had Mike Micah on your show? No, I'd like to though. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. 
he's an amazing human being. And you know hit one of his stories, right? Like he uh he hacked Donkey Kong to to uh change it to um I guess it was a Pauline. Who's in the first yeah. Donkey Kong? Yeah, Pauline. She saves Mario instead. Yeah. So his little girl could play the game and be Pauline, not Mario. And <laughs> pretty cool. That got so much pickup and attention. And he's just a really Oh yeah, he's over at uh Digital Eclipse. Is that that's is right? Still with it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had um yep. we had Stephen Frost on the show. And yeah, that we oh, love great. Dig- digital eclipse is so cool, man. Like we just we love everything they're doing over there and just talk about yeah. preservation. I mean, they're they're doing that extra mile thing and just we love seeing seeing all this stuff just being archived in, in such a, a great way, you know, and the presentation of it all. I mean, that's that's something you guys definitely have Big in time. common. You know what we need is a is a guy like Kojima to step up and talk about how important that that uh, preservation of this content is. But the the other statistic, Nitroid. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I was just saying Nitroid. Is, that's normally his soapbox. He he loves talking preservation and stuff. So I don't have that much. Oh, swing. it's so important. <laughs> it's. Uh, I think you know we we definitely need like one of those leaders to to say look we have to do this but I think the other stat and all the movie studios are kind of in this same boat as well is like we are in uh we're we're being buried in content like we have mm-hmm. so much stuff as a as a human re- and and now with yeah. all of our cameras and our YouTube and everything like everything else that we all have at our fingertips it's insane like just trying to find the time to look through all of this stuff it, mm-hmm. it's almost like we're you know as we pivot to ai it's like we're building the future species that will be able to actually mine through this much <laughs> material because a human in a lifetime could not you know yeah. like it's like and so much stuff is flopping because of it i mean it's just like i feel like there's too I much stuff lost, it's coming yeah. out there i'm like wait what oh this is out well i don't I don't have the time to buy that yet right now, or, you know, I don't have the time to play it. So I'm not going to buy it. So that first week sales, you know, it's just timing is everything right now with release windows. I mean, agreed. Yeah. I mean, something like 70% of commercial indie games are considered failures because they just, nobody knows about them or they don't make enough money. And, you know, being on the media side, it's really hard to find the time to play those games Mm -hmm. if I'm playing The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for 200 hours before (laughs) I'm finished. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like there is this finite amount of time and we only get a, a, you know, a gas can filled with X number of games. And I think the industry needs to, they need to think about how much they spend to make them. They need to think about how much they charge to buy them. and, And they need to think about how much time they require to build and play yeah. and uh all of that needs to i think persist in harmony with each other so that it's healthy for the whole business yeah it's, it feels super unsustainable like right now it just feels everything is crashing right now <laughs> big time it's all like one giant pissing match it's like no you're gonna stay and play my live service game forever and we're gonna take a thousand hours of your life and your friends lives and you're not gonna have time to buy any of these single player games and these single player games are like no you can only play it on this machine and you know it's 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 nuts all of these obstacles that we've put in front of and and lots of single player games that are like well in 10 hours it'll be fun but we we need 10 (laughs) hours of your life before before the fun kicks in and by the way, it costs two hundred million dollars. And if we don't sell X amount <laughs> yeah. of copies, we can never do this again. Yeah. I, and honestly, I got Spider-Man Two, Marvel Spider-Man Two for PS Five was my favorite game of last year, and that was a game that I think was one of those games that paid attention to all of that, at least in my estimation. And I played it, and I felt like not one second was spent spinning wheels. Like yeah. every second, mo- the threaded between the narrative and the play, all of it was crazy, crazy fun. It, it, part of it is that it's Spider-Man. And it's just fun to play as this character that that traverses like that. Mm-hmm. But I I just thought it was astoundingly well put together. And uh, I, I was riveted. I loved it. Yeah, we love our single player games here. And just, you yeah, know, there's, there's definitely stuff like Hell Divers too that comes out every once in a while. Take a big chunk all of a sudden. Like, wait, I'm, I'm addicted to this now. Shit. But. Yeah, a, Hell, Hell Divers is great. Yeah. R.I.P. Railgun. R.I.P. Railgun. Damn it, they <laughs> they screwed <laughs> us. They screwed us this morning. It's okay. We'll get oh, did they nerf this. it? They nerfed the hell out of it, man. It's it's like uh, you gotta get five six shots on a charger now to break a leg, get that armor out. Do you anyway, guys jetpack or no? Uh, I haven't done too much jetpacking. I'm I've been doing shields and uh laser rover, but yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I haven't got to the laser. Ro- I'm level ten right now, so I'm, I'm like forty six on my way. <laughs> are you? What's yeah. the cap right now? Is it fifty? Uh, fifty, yeah. So yeah. So what do you what do you call yourselves? Like a death? Uh, I think I'm like at a admiral right now, and I think yeah, it's like death admiral at the end or something like that. Death admiral. Yeah, Amazing. It's pretty metal. Fuck, I want to be that. <laughs> <laughs> that game is a great example of like you know you pay forty dollars to get in, and then it's got a little bit of microtransaction if you want to save that time. But if you don't, yeah. like just play the game and you get those super credits, and you can unlock the battle pass for free. It's like you know just they're doing it right, and they they nailed it. Yeah, and that's why that game they is like the it. flash. Not I don't want to call it a flash in the pan, but because they're gonna it looks like they have a big roadmap for that game and it's going to get better and better they're bringing mechs and vehicles and all this cool shit like today they added uh meteors and volcanoes that have like lava tornadoes that come at you it's fun wow Uh, (laughs) Wow. but you know it it seems like they have a good head on their shoulders it's going to take a lot you know i think more of those smaller studios that are like no we're doing it this way we're not going to get bought out by a committee that's going to try to milk this monetization and the you know all the yeah the microtransactions it's it's pretty manageable in Helldivers, so. They really killed it, but they worked for a long time on this game too, right? I, I, I don't know if Arrowhead had anything in between the first one and this one, but we've been waiting a long time for this one, so they really have been paying attention. Mm-hmm. They spent a lot of money on it, but it does feel, all, all of it feels manageable and just it leans towards value for the player. Yeah. You know, it, it all feels like there's a respect for the player, whereas... Almost all the other live service and free to play stuff I play, almost all of it, it, it feels um, like you're playing a cagey game with the <laughs> designers on when their hand will come out and when yeah. they'll say, You having fun? How about you throw down another 10 bucks for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they try to just trick you with like the all of a sudden you're like about to hit A to continue to the next screen. It's like, Wait, almost at two ninety nine on something. Like, hold on, why is it asking for my credit card? Yeah, this sucks. I just spent my first money in, in, um, Fortnite, and it, it was a real grapple with myself. I bought the damn turtles. Yeah, that was what got me too, man. There. They got the turtles I, and then and, Silent and Snake I, right after, and I was like, shit, they got me this month. <laughs> like, they, yeah, and and my whole sort of like talking with myself was, well, I, I buy the action figures. I love the turtles <laughs> action figures. This is just like that. I'm yep. buying a digital action figure. Yeah. And so I bought them. I'm not proud of myself, but I did it. Yep. Just seeing seeing Donatello hit the gritty though. I mean, you, you can't go wrong. It's it's great. <laughs> oh, it's really cool. Stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Victor, we really appreciate you coming on the show, man. Uh, if people want to tune in to these new classic episodes, that's on the on the EPN YouTube or yeah, it's the it's sort of the main mothership right now. Things may evolve and change, but we've got to get started with what we have. It's youtubecom slash TV. Uh, that's that's where the the shows will premiere. I also stream all the time on twitch.tv slash EPN. And uh, I'm on all the freaking platforms. It's impossible to try to keep up with all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I post in little bits and pieces all over the damn place. But would love to see you guys show up for the premiere and and, and uh, tune into these wacky episodes and, and, and um, go back to a simpler time with yeah. me. <laughs> It's going to be a blast from the past. Yeah, absolutely. I'm there. Oh, I'll be there with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You'll see the same sweater. I, and it's so embarrassing. I, I, I had this cool looking sweater that I liked in the day and I wore it all the freaking time. I didn't know I would be in it. I, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but it, it's in a lot of episodes. So be prepared. <laughs> Super excited for it. Awesome, man. We look forward to it. Thanks, you guys. All right, thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Have a good evening. All right, take care.